We are glad that you are here. I'm Kenny. And I'm Sandra, and we are part of the leadership team here at Falkirk Vineyard Church. So welcome to church. This morning, we are going to hear from God's Word as we finish our Steps on the Journey series. And then we'll respond in worship, and after that, we'll give you some updates of things that are going on in our church. Then we'll jump over onto Zoom so we can get together in real time. Mm. It's a chance for us to talk to each other, encourage one another, speak prophetically over each other, and pray for each other. And we've loved these calls, mm. especially during our current circumstances, because they've been another great opportunity for us to stay connected and committed to each other. And you know, our weeks are full of commitments, appointments, our jobs, chores, and tasks that we make time for and give our energy to. We are experts at filling our schedules and becoming busy. But you know, in our busyness, we can tend to focus more on what's next rather than on what's important. So we need to be regularly reminded that our number one focus is God himself. And that is why our church gatherings are such a gift. We block out this time every week to get together to worship God, to receive from him and encourage and build each other up. And we know that no matter what is going on in that week, Sunday mornings are a chance to refocus on God and our commitment to him. It's also a time where we can focus on each other, <laughs> preferring each other, mm -hmm. loving one another. Just being here, you being here, is an encouragement to others. And yes, we want and we desire God's presence, but we also value and desire each other's presence. We really value the fact that you prioritize being here this morning. And we want to read a psalm as we get ready to hear from the Lord this morning. It's Psalm 1, and it says this, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. But whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, prospers. Why don't we pray, and then we'll hand over to Andrew. Lord, thank you that we get to be here this morning with each other and with you. We know that the, your presence is in each home, with each family and each person, and that in your presence, we are united as we worship, as we come before you, as we listen to what you want to say to us. So we just ask, Lord, this morning for that sense of our hearts being joined together, and we want to be the kind of people who meditate on your word, yes, who receive your wisdom, who learn how to live this life from you. So as we get ready to hear um, the sermon from Andrew, we just pray that you would bless his words to us, that they would go deep into our hearts, and that most of all, we would hear from you, that you would shape us and mold us and form us, change our thinking, and remind us of what's important this morning. Mm -hmm. And we pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, over to Pastor Andrew. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our final week um, of our series Steps on the Journey, where we have been going through uh, 15 Psalms that collectively are known as the Songs of Ascent. We've been travelling to Jerusalem for these past few months and today is the day that we have arrived. Uh, we've covered 14 steps so far and now today we've reached the 15th and final step, the highest point of ascent um, and today we are uh, going to be encouraged to bring praises to the Lord our God. If you can think back to the beginning of this series in Psalm 120, the first song of ascent, we heard a call to turn away from the world and turn towards God. And so began our journey um, uh, towards Jerusalem 
um, to be present with God and his temple. And this journey began with repentance um, in the foreign lands of Meshach and Kedar. We started from a place of anguish and grief, but now we conclude our journey today um, in a place of great blessing. And each step of this journey has been marked by a song. Uh, and now the worshippers who have travelled in this journey join together in Jerusalem to worship and give praise to God. And I guess we began this journey as a search for peace. And, and along the way we've scaled some towering mountains. Uh, we've cried out to God for mercy. We've celebrated our deliverance. Uh, we've committed to live our lives uh, working for the freedom of others. Uh, we've been reminded of the need to live out our faith in the context of community and in relationship. And we've also realised that we don't know it all either. Like on our journey with Jesus in this um, thing we call discipleship, um, that we are still growing and learning uh, and maturing uh, along that journey as well. But now at last we are in Psalm uh, 134 and our journey is complete. The difficult mountains, all the ascents are behind us. But I don't want us to get in our heads that we have reached the end of the line here or this is the, the finishing point. I think this is more of a starting point that, that we're at today. Because this place where we've arrived isn't so much a place or a destination. We have arrived to be in the presence of the one that we worship. I don't think as the pilgrims um, started on this journey to Jerusalem that it was ever a quest to find a building. It was ever, never just a quest to reach or to be at the temple. I don't think the pilgrims laced up their boots, climbing peak after peak, trudging through sweltering heat, fighting battle after battle just to arrive in Jerusalem and stand outside the temple and take a selfie. I think the point and purpose of this pilgrimage was, was to step into the full, unfiltered presence of God. And not just that, but the people were going to do it together with all the other pilgrims who had travelled to be there. I don't think the pilgrims dreamt of just attending a religious event or being a passive observer in, in an audience. They came to meet with and stand in awe of God. So our journey began back in Psalm 120 with these words. But the psalmist said in Psalm 120 verse 1, I am in trouble. I cry to God desperate for an answer. And today our journey ends with these words in Psalm 134. It says this, O oh, praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, you who serve at night in the house of the Lord. Lift your hands towards the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Jerusalem. So today we're going to take a bit of time just to consider what it means to bless the Lord. In the passage we read, it was from the New Living Translation, and those first two verses um, use the phrase, praise the Lord, but that can be um, equally um, translated as bless the Lord. The, the word translated to, for, to praise or to bless is the same word in Hebrew. So in the first two verses of, of this psalm, those words bless and praise are interchangeable. So rather than saying praise the Lord, we could say bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, or lift up your hands and bless the Lord. So in this psalm, when we are told to bless the Lord, we are being reminded that we are to give reverence to God. And that means that we are to continually give God first place in our lives, make God our priority. It is reminding us that we are to be attuned to the presence of God, that blessing God is an act of praise and worship, that blessing God is what we do when we think about how we worship God uh, and that he is the maker of heaven and earth, but also we worship God because he has blessed us. The thing that I find really interesting about this psalm is that it not only says that we are to bless God, but that God blesses us. 
Now, the word bless uh, in both contexts here of us blessing God and God blessing us, the word bless here literally means to kneel or to bow down. Now, that works for me when I think of you and I bowing down um, and blessing God. But how does that work when we talk about God blessing us? Is, is the psalm saying that God kneels? Well, I think that's exactly what the psalm is telling us. It's not that God worships and praises us. It's that he does good things for us. God um, blesses us by choosing to be among us. God chooses to bless us. Here's what I think the difference is. When we bless God, we kneel or bow down before him in worship. When God blesses us, he kneels or reaches down to take care of us and of our needs. We bless God by praising him for who he is and what he has done. And God blesses us by loving us and providing for us. Kneeling was um, really significant in Hebrew worship. The, the knees uh, were regarded as a symbol of strength. So to bend the knee, uh, therefore, is to bend your strength before the living God. It's an act uh, of complete surrender. So for us to bless God literally means that we bring our gift of worship to him on bended knee and we surrender completely to him. Eugene Peterson, in his book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, puts it like this. He says, God gets down on his knees among us. He gets on our level and shares himself with us. He does not reside afar off and send us diplomatic messages. He kneels among us. That posture is characteristic of God. The discovery and realisation of this is what defines what we know of God as good news. God shares himself generously and graciously. As soon as God reveals himself to us, as soon as he chooses to enter into a relationship with us, he kneels. That God is so willing to bless us and so willing to reveal himself to us and so willing to enter into a relationship with us means that this is a God whose main character feature is forgiveness and love. And it's only this kind of love that can explain how God's people can hope and know that the Lord will bless them. For the children of Israel, God's love was their only hope. And God's love is our only hope. It is this love, this God, who was made flesh in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the ultimate example of God kneeling. God kneels to our level and meets us where we are. This is what the gospel is all about. It is about a God who sticks with us through good times and hard times, through laughter and tears. He never leaves us. He never abandons us. And that ultimately is why we bless God. Remember, God's blessing comes first. We must always remember that. When we bless, when we praise, when we worship, we are responding to what God has already done. When we kneel, we must remember that God knelt first. He knelt to give us the gift of himself. He knelt to give us a gift of salvation, to give us a gift of life, the gift of peace, of love and of eternal blessing in his presence. So this psalm is an invitation to worship an invitation to bless God. And it's also a command to worship, a command to bless God. And no matter what brings you to Jerusalem, no matter what brings you to the house of worship, no matter what brings you to church today, you are to bless God. And it doesn't matter what happened before you arrived, it doesn't matter what happened on the way here, you are to bless God. And this reminds us that no matter how difficult our journey may be right now, no matter how arduous this road is that we travel on, we are still invited to bless God and that we are called to do so not only when the circumstances are ideal, but to always bless him. You know, I think that God knows that blessing him and kneeling before him doesn't come naturally to us. 
He knows that we need reminded that he is always to be praised. And that's why Psalm 134 begins it as it does in a number of translations with the word come or the word behold. So for example, in the English Standard Version, Psalm 134 begins with come, bless the Lord, O ye servants of the Lord. And the New King James Version begins, behold, bless the Lord, O ye servants of the Lord. This is the, the equivalent of God saying to us, I want your attention. It's like, come, behold, excuse me, I'm here, I want your attention. God is asking us to stop what we're doing, to interrupt our thoughts and to pay attention to him. And this psalm um, is addressed to the servants who minister in the house of God. Now, in those days, those servants who ministered in the house of God are the priests, the priests of the temple, and they were all from the tribe of Levi. And these Levi priests were entrusted with the ministry of worship. They led the people of Israel in worship. So if the priests whose job, whose vocation and whose calling was to work in the temple and who were focused solely on worship and leading people in worship, if they needed reminded to praise God, how much more do we need that? So are you okay with God interrupting you? Are you okay that, with God interrupting you so that he can receive your attention and the praise he deserves from you? And how many things in your day do you make more important than God? John Wimber, um, the founder of the Vineyard Movement, said this. He said, show me, show me where you spend your time and I'll tell you what you worship. Although this psalm is addressed to the Levite priests of the temple, this invitation, this command is also for us today. As believers today, we are all servants of the Lord. We find this in 1 Peter chapter 2, where Peter says, You are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As believers in Christ, as followers of Jesus, we are all priests in the kingdom of God. We are all called to declare his praises. All of God's people should praise him. But not only that, all of God's people should praise him at all times. The focus in this psalm is also on corporate worship, coming together as a tribe. This, these people have travelled from all over them from different places to come together in one place and you know as a church we need one another we need to come together and I believe that we worship best when we're together Psalm 134 reminds us that our highest achievement and our greatest aspiration is to worship God our audience when we worship is God do you know that all of the remaining psalms after Psalm 134, there's 16 of them, 135 to 150, they all concern themselves with worship. They all talk about worship. And that reminds us that worship is the goal of the follower of Jesus. Worship is our destination. Worship is our purpose. Just like it says in the Westminster, Westminster Catechism, it says that the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. This last song of ascent, this invitation, this encouragement to sing our own personal love song to Yahweh, to the Lord, this is a call that goes beyond any ritual, ceremony or tradition. So how do we bless the Lord? Well, we find an answer to that in the book of Hebrews. Um, it says this in Hebrews 13 verse 15, that through Jesus, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. So we are to bless God, bless the Lord with our lips, with our words. Now, we know that um, there's more to our relationship with God than just singing songs to him. We know that. But it's also true that the, the, the core of any good relationship is conversation. There has to be conversation in a good relationship. Our personal conversations with God begin with spoken gratitude. Jesus taught, that, taught us that in the Lord's Prayer. 
But when we are together, when we are a tribe, when we come together as a church, the appropriate way for us to step into the presence of God is with voices raised in praise, hands lifted and hearts engaged as we stand together before him. You see, the psalmist is saying here, this is why we've come. This is why we embarked on this sometimes discouraging, overwhelming and frightening journey because we wanted God. We wanted to see his, fa his face. We longed just to be in his presence. So now that we're here, let's bless him. Let's worship him. Let's sing praises as his presence shines down on us. When we come together as we are right now, or again, maybe not as we are right now, but as we long to be together in person without any restriction. Um, when we come together like that, it's much more than a ritual or a ceremony or a tradition. When we come together like this, it's a family celebration. We come together as a church to worship and respond to God with exuberance as a whole tribe. All you servants of the Lord are invited to sing out. And this is how our church gatherings should look. But sadly, that is not a reality just now. But I want to encourage you um, to know that this season of separation that we're in just now, that is not our destination. This season of separation that we're in just now is a journey. I believe that we are on a journey towards the reassembling of the people of God and we're going to come to ble together to bless Yahweh, the Lord of heaven and earth, in a more powerful way than we've ever experienced before. Singing, raising our voices, our allegiance to Jesus pouring from our lips. This is how we worship together. We worship as a tribe. And you know it's beautiful, it's inspiring, it's encouraging and it's uplifting. And it's also humbling and it's intimate, it's emotional and it's healing. And you know, God loves it. Psalm 134 is a song that encourages us not to hold back. In verse 2 of our psalm, it says this, Lift your hands towards the sanctuary and praise the Lord. As I already said, the final 16 songs in the book of Psalms paint a beautiful picture of authentic and honest contemplation of God um, through exuberant, loud musical expression. Now, some churches might be perceived as getting too carried away uh, in their fervour uh, with worship, while others might be perceived as being too stiff. Now, anyone that knows me will know that my personal preference in worshipping together is enthusiasm. I love the, the build and, and the atmosphere that lifts when we're all singing together. And in Falkirk Vineyard, our gathered worship experience is expressed outwardly, both with high volume and physical expression, but it's also expressed outwardly with quiet contemplation and humble posture. But it is appropriate to raise hands during a song of worship to God or in a prayer towards God. Now, let me be clear, our physical expression of raised hands is not to make us look more spiritual and neither is a closed um, expression like this um, to give the impression of appearing uh, incredibly humble. When we lift our hands to God or when we do we give any physical gesture, any expression outwardly, um, that is not as calling attention to ourselves. It is an outward expression of our, of our gesture of worship for what's in our hearts. Lifting our hands and being enthusiastic and shouting out and singing out isn't to make us seem more holy or more spiritual. It simply gives us a means of expressing our heartfelt adoration of God. And more than that, this outward physical expression um, of worship is biblical. In Psalm 134, we've already read that the raising of hands in worship is commanded. And we see this confirmed in the New Testament as well, when Paul writes to Timothy 
and says that in every place of worship, I want men to pray with holy hands lifted up to God. You know, lifting holy hands as well isn't necessarily all to do with emotion either. It's a, as another um, uh, as another um, impression that's sometimes falsely given. Although having said that, it's absolutely okay to be emotional before God and be an emotion and be emotional in our worship. But this lifting of hands, we can do that regardless of how we feel, because we might not be able to control how we feel, but we can control our our arms and our hands. We can choose to lift them in blessing regardless of how we feel. So I guess what I'm trying to emphasize here is, is don't let your feelings dictate your actions. Because regardless of how we feel, we are commanded to bless the Lord. Regardless of how we feel, we are commanded to love our neighbor. Regardless of how we feel, we are commanded to encourage and build up one another. Regardless of our feelings, we are commanded to not neglect our meeting together. Regardless of how we feel, we are commanded to lift up our hands to God. The lifting up of our hands reminds us of a number of things. First of all, it reminds us that our worship is directed towards God. Raising our hands indicate that we are looking to God in our worship and whatever blessings we may be seeking are coming from him. And I've also heard it described as our lifting of hands can be like in the posture of a child asking a parent to pick them up. So it's like this. And that would be a symbolic of an act of trust. Like, God, I, I, I want you to pick me up. And it's a desire for God's security. And lifting up of hands is also a sign of repentance to show that we want our hands to be clean and that we want to be right before God. Psalm 24 Say, says this, asks the question, who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those with hands and hearts that are pure. And lifting up our hands to God also shows that they are empty. We cannot approach God or serve him if our hands are already full of other things. God has things to give us and we need empty hands to receive them. When we enter a time of prayer or ministry or receiving from God in our church, isn't this the posture we take? And we do this because we want to offer to God a posture of expectancy and surrender. Open hands show our willingness to let God rule our lives and to empower us. Our empty hands show God that we are available to be used. And our uplifted hands show a willingness to receive whatever God may choose to place in them. Because worship isn't something you do only when you feel like it. And you know, I'm pretty certain that you might not always feel like coming to church. But when you do, God uses your action of moving to be with his people to come to corporate worship. And he uses that to raise you up. If we waited until we felt like worshipping, we might never worship at all. Sometimes half the effort is showing up. And maybe sometimes showing up is the best that we can do. We show up for worship even though we might not be in the mood. And some Sundays we might barely make it to church, we just get there, but we come anyway to see what God has for us and we offer him our worship. God deserves your praise regardless of how you may feel at any given time, because worship is the highest form of love. As we conclude this final song of ascent, our psalm ends with a brief chorus that says, May the Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Jerusalem. Psalm 134 closes out these songs of ascent by teaching us that the life that blesses God as a life that is blessed by God. And the very act of praising God is a blessing in itself. When we bless God, we are blessed. And when we bless God, God promises to add his own blessing to it. Our whole lives are meant to be worship. Every thought, every word, every action should be worship. 
And as followers of Jesus, we are called to live a life that brings praise and honour and blessing to God. And when we do, we know that God's blessing is on our lives. You know, when you climb a mountain, if you've ever climbed a mountain it as I've done, the first thing I know that I do when I get to the top is that I turn around and I look back at where I've come from. I want to see how high I've climbed and how far I've walked. And it's the same with these songs of ascent. Now that we've reached the top, we should look back and see how far that we've come. Because along the way, if we look back, we've learned important lessons in this series, on this journey. We've learned lessons of trust and dependence on God. We've learned that we need perseverance and faith. We, we need forgiveness and humility. And we need unity and blessing. As I've been thinking about this psalm, um, I've been singing in my head some of the many songs and hymns that have been inspired by Psalm 134. But in particular, um, I've been singing in my head the doxology, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And then it just dawned on me um, as I was uh, singing that to myself the other day, that that line, Praise God, that's us blessing God, from whom blessings flow is God blessing us. Praise God from whom blessings flow. Other, in other words, the life that blesses God is a life that is blessed by God. And you know, this is a narrative that we find throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Jesus, in the Sermon of the Mount, instructs us to do this, to take the focus of life off of ourselves um, and onto God our Father. And when we do this in our practical everyday living, we are worshipping God, not only by praising him, but also by depending on him to meet our needs. And when we depend on God, he will provide for us and protect us. He will bless us. This is what Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount about this. And, and so I'm doing, it's quite a long passage, but I want you to read it because I think it's important that we get the context of um, how Jesus has instructed us to live um, so that we can go and we can be on that journey with him and the correct mindset and the correct posture. Jesus says this in Matthew 6 and 28, I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. Don't they, they don't work or make clothing. Yet Solomon in all, all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. So why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly father already knows all your needs. So seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Seek the kingdom of God first. Put God in first place. Seek him and he will find you. Bless him and you will be blessed. He will give you everything you need. So what do you need today? Not what you want. What do you need? What Jesus, a believer, one of the things Jesus is teaching us in these verses is this. When our attention is on ourself, we will discover what we want. When our attention is on God, we will discover what we need. We're going to worship now, the Falkirk Vineyard tribe. We are going to worship. And as I hand over to the worship team, I just wanted to take a minute just to raise our hands to God in prayer. So we do that with me. Why do we raise our hands? 
And we say, thank you, Father. We bless you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. You have delivered us and given us life. You have knelt down. You have reached down and invited us to be where you are. We lift our hands to you and say, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honour and glory and power forever and ever. Amen.
Brilliant. Thank you, Andrew, for reminding us of the blessing that comes from obeying God's command to worship him. I love that idea that as we bow down before God and worship, he bends down mm. to bless us with his presence. And thank you to Aidan and Moira for leading us in worship so we could immediately put into practice what we've been taught. And I love the line in that song that says, by your name, I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected king is resurrecting me. In fact, Romans 10 says that if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Now, Jesus saves us from our sin. He gives us freedom from shame and guilt, overcomes the darkness that has tried to push us down, and gives us a new kind of life that is so comprehensive that the Bible says that believing in Jesus makes us new creations. You might be watching today and you've been thinking a lot recently about what life is really about. The truth is that real life comes from God and is made available through his son, Jesus. Jesus calls all people, no matter who you are, to follow after him and to become his apprentice and to receive true life from him. And to get in on this new life, we need to turn away from our way of living life, turn to Jesus and receive forgiveness, healing from our past and a whole new way of living. It's a gift. This new life is a gift that Jesus has provided for us through his death and his resurrection. And that's why Romans 10 talks about confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart that he died and rose again. So if you want to follow Jesus, you can do that right now. I'm going to pray and you can pray right along with me. Okay, here we go. Jesus, I believe that you are Lord. I believe that you died on the cross and rose again. I believe that you will forgive my sin, change my heart, renew my thinking, free me from my past, and give me new life. I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to be a part of what you are doing in the world. I want today to be the first day of my new life with you. So I give my life to you. Amen. Wow. Well, if you prayed that prayer, you can click the button below that says, I commit my life to Jesus. Or you can put a message in the chat. And even better, best way to tell us would be to join us on our Zoom call in a couple of minutes so that we can celebrate with you. But before we get to our Zoom call, we wanted to let you know about a few things that are happening in the next couple of weeks. Um, on 31st of October at 6.30pm, Vineyard Kids UK are holding a massive online kids party. It's called the We Shine Light Party. And it's all about letting kids know that they can be a positive presence in the world, sharing God's good news wherever they go. The party will be full of songs, games, crafts, and so much more. And we'd love all of our kids to sign up to take part. Parents, get your kids registered. And you can do this by visiting vineyardchurches.org.uk forward slash events. Also, our FB Kids videos go live every Sunday at 9 a.m. And if you haven't seen today's video yet, check it out at falkirkvineyard.com forward slash kids. If you're a young adult, a run, a root, if you, I'm not a young adult, so I'm starting to slur my words. But if you're a young adult, you can register for the Cause to Live For national online event, which is coming up in November. Details and registration at cause to live for.org. Dot UK. I think my dentures started <laughs> falling out there. Well, every Sunday night, Falkirk Vineyard gets together to pray. And we believe that prayer changes things. 
And one of the ways that believers in Jesus can partner with him is by praying and praying together. Our prayer gathering is tonight at 8 p.m. on Zoom, and it's another opportunity to share God's presence together. And you can get the Zoom link at falkirkvineyard.com forward slash what's on. Well done. It's right there. <laughs> Our Torah Bible study is this Thursday. I have to say, um, it's been a lot of fun. And it's also been a real joy to watch people come alive um, because we've been seeing Jesus all through the pages of the Old Testament. And we're learning that all of Scripture leads us to faith in Him. People have even messaged me to say that this study has helped them to just kind of recognize God's presence and His action in their daily lives, in their every circumstances. And you're welcome to join us this Thursday at 8 p.m. And you can get the Zoom link at, uh, well, you can't get the Zoom link, you can register um, at falkirkvineyard.com forward slash what's on. And then we will send you the Zoom link. So you need to click on that registration button. And finally, if you would like to give to Falkirk Vineyard as part of your worship and as a way to bless God and bless others, then you can visit falkirkvineyard.com forward slash give to find out how to give financially. Okay. Time has come. It's time for us now to hop over onto Zoom so we can all see each other mm-hmm. and have a chat and pray and all that good kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So we really want you to come and join us. Um, yeah, so the Zoom link is going to be posted in the chat if you're on the church online platform. If you're on Facebook Live or on YouTube, then in the comment section, um, there will be a link over to the church online platform where you can find the Zoom link. But come on. There's no reason not to come and join us. We're friendly, (laughs) kind, most of the time, loving, and a good laugh. So click the link, come and join us on our Zoom call. Okay, see you there.